Hi, welcome to Aviation Theory. In this video, we will talk about the composition of the Earth's atmosphere and its characteristics. So, let's get started. As we mentioned in a previous video, the atmosphere is the gaseous layer that surrounds the Earth. It accompanies the planet in its rotation and translation movements, serving as a kind of protective layer between the surface and space. More specifically, the mixture of gases that composes the atmosphere is known as air. Now, the atmosphere plays a very important role in determining the environmental conditions of our planet, since it provides the ideal conditions for the evolution of life and ecosystems as we know them. Among its main functions, we can highlight that it generates the necessary atmospheric pressure for liquid water to exist. It also absorbs a significant amount of ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun. And finally, it helps to dampen temperature variations during day and night. Now, an important property of air is that it is a compressible fluid. This implies that due to the Earth's gravity, most of the air is concentrated near the surface, in the lower levels of the atmosphere. This way, 50% of the air that constitutes the atmosphere is concentrated within the first 5 kilometers of altitude. 90% of the air is concentrated within the first 16 kilometers, and 99% of the air is below 32 kilometers of altitude. With this, it is evident that as the altitude increases, the air becomes less and less dense. However, despite the fact that below 32 kilometers of altitude, we find 99% of atmospheric air, the truth is that above this level, we still find molecules of air, but they are very spread apart. So, at this point, you might be wondering, where does the atmosphere end? Or, in other words, what is the altitude at which we find the boundary between atmosphere and space? Well, actually, there is not an exact level that defines this boundary. This is because as we go up in the atmosphere, the air gradually becomes less and less dense until we eventually reach space. However, from an aeronautical perspective, the Kármán line is often used as reference for this, which is at an altitude of approximately 120 kilometers. Using this line is useful because below this level, the spacecraft re-entering the Earth begin to experience significant atmospheric effects. However, we must clarify that above this altitude we can still find air, but it is so widely spread apart that in practice, it does not have any significant influence on larger objects. Now, in this order of ideas we could think that due to the Earth's gravity, in the lower levels of the atmosphere, we would find the heavier gases, such as oxygen or carbon dioxide, while in the upper levels we would find the lighter gases, such as helium or hydrogen. However, the truth is that in practice, this just does not happen. This is because the Earth's rotation, the friction with the surface, and the temperature variations force air to circulate and mix constantly, which is known as atmospheric circulation. This constant atmospheric circulation in search of equilibrium, especially at low levels in the atmosphere, causes the gases to mix with each other. This way, we obtain a mixture of gases of fixed proportions from the surface up to an altitude of about 70 kilometers. Above this level, the atmospheric circulation is not as significant, so at higher altitudes gases begin to separate due to gravity according to the weight of each element, leaving the heavier gases at the bottom and the lighter gases at the upper levels. With this being said, since air operations are carried out in the lower levels of the atmosphere, let us look at the composition of this mixture of gases found near the surface. The air here is composed of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% of other gases such as argon, carbon dioxide, neon, helium, ozone, and others. It is important to note that since we are talking about a mixture of gases, it means that they do not react chemically with each other, maintaining their original form as inner gases. Now, we must emphasize that this is the composition of a dry sample of air under ideal conditions, because in practice, in the lower levels of the atmosphere, the air also contains water vapor, which is known as humidity. Water vapor is simply water in its gaseous state, and therefore humidity is the measurement of how much water vapor is contained in a certain volume of air. To get an idea of how significant its presence is, 
The water vapor content in the atmosphere at sea level normally varies between 0 and 5 percent, depending on factors such as air temperature or the geographical characteristics of the area. Now, since humidity depends in part on the air temperature, as we go up in the atmosphere and the air temperature decreases, the humidity also decreases, so that above an altitude of 10 kilometers, the presence of water vapor is minimal. Now, in practice, apart from water vapor, the air also contains tiny little solid particles in suspension, known as aerosols. Here we can highlight things like salt, sand, dust, smoke, and ash. And even though in many cases these aerosols are invisible to the naked eye, their presence in the atmosphere allows the formation of clouds, fog, snow, among other meteorological phenomena. This is because these tiny little particles act as condensation and freezing nuclei, but we will talk about them in more detail in a future video. Now, as we just said, despite their low concentration in the atmosphere, water vapor and aerosols are responsible for most atmospheric phenomena. Actually, the study of the vast majority of meteorological phenomena is based on the analysis of the behavior of water in the atmosphere, whether it is in liquid, solid, or gaseous state. However, although they contribute substantially, these are not the only factors that condition the Earth's climate, as there are also those known as greenhouse effect gases. Here we can highlight carbon dioxide, methane, or water vapor, which allow us to have adequate and pleasant temperatures for the evolution of life and ecosystems. Let's take a look at a quick explanation of what the greenhouse effect consists of. During the day, the sun emits shortwave radiation that is absorbed by the Earth's surface, causing its temperature to rise. This type of radiation passes through the atmosphere easily, as it is not absorbed by the gases that constitute the air. However, during the night, the hot surface emits longwave radiation back into space, but on its way, this type of radiation is absorbed by some gases in the atmosphere, specifically the greenhouse gases. This effect prevents all the heat from being lost back into space, since some of it remains trapped in the atmosphere, allowing temperatures to be suitable for life. Now, it is important to clarify that this greenhouse effect is necessary to maintain the natural balance of the planet to a certain extent. The problem is when there is an excess of these greenhouse gases, as this necessarily leads to a general increase in global temperatures. This phenomenon is known as global warming, and it generates significant climate changes among other negative effects on ecosystems, but we will not go into detail on this topic in this video. Let's move on to the atmospheric properties. Air, being a mixture of gases, is a fluid and therefore has physical properties such as pressure, temperature, humidity, density, among others. These are directly related through the ideal gas law, which implies that a change in one of these variables will necessarily affect the others. In addition to this, we must take into account that the values of these variables change depending on the region, season, weather, and altitude. In fact, the most significant changes in these variables occur with altitude. Since as altitude increases, the pressure decreases at a higher and higher rate, as we can see in the graph on the right. However, unlike pressure, as we can see in the graph on the left, temperature has a rather curious behavior, since depending on the altitude range analyzed, temperature can increase or decrease at different rates. And it is mainly for this reason that according to the behavior of air temperature with altitude, the atmosphere is divided into different layers. Each of these layers has different characteristics and phenomena that make the temperature behave in one way or the other. However, we will talk about these layers in more detail in the following video. I hope the information presented in this video was useful. If so, don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. It would help me a lot. Thanks for watching, and I see you next time.